hello, hello, party people. Let's make some noise. Ah! Thank you. And we are back <laughs> for another episode of the IBS Freedom Podcast. I am joined by the lovely and oh so pregnant at the time of this recording, Amy Hollenkamp, RD. Hello, my hey, darling. Hey, everybody. Five more weeks and we'll have a baby. So basically, honestly, we're a little bit ahead on the recording. So by the time this <laughs> right. episode airs, you will probably be up to your eyebrows Ooh. in cute baby smells. That's probably true. Oh, my gosh. That is... Yeah. That is bananas. I can't wait yeah. for the barrage of Instagram photo updates. I told you yeah. recently, right? I don't check Instagram stories ever. I don't really see the appeal of stories. I hardly use them myself. But I always make a point to check yours. And I'm glad that I did the other day because you posted some maternity photos, including yes. a picture of Chip being a proud big brother. Yes, he was very... I'm excited because that was just like the sneak peek that our photographer sent. Oh, okay. So... It wasn't all of them. It was just sort of some of her favorites, I guess. Yeah. So I'm curious because we took a lot with Chip. So like, I'm very curious to see some of the Chip stuff. And she was like so impressed because he could like hold the camera. Like he could gaze at the camera. So she kept being like, he's a model and all this stuff. But it was it was fun to do. And it was kind of crazy because it was supposed to rain and it like just held out. It kind of rained a little bit towards the end of of the shoot, but mm-hmm. it it was fun. That um, makes for nice diffuse lighting, though. Yeah, it it did. I think it all worked out. My hair got a little frizz frizzed out towards the end, but um, for the most part, it it, it worked out a okay. I'm excited to see more chip picks, and then we're we'll have the same photographer do somewhat newborny type yeah. picks, mm-hmm. which will be really cute. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll uh, I'll share. We didn't do any sort of like official photo shoots. Um, actually, no, that's a lie. We did one of the ones where you go into like Sears or whatever, and you go to the photo studio, which is always just kind of comical. Um, right. We did one of those at one point with Jess, but my mom is obsessed with taking pictures and photography. And I kid you not, uh, there was one point we're going to get into actually useful stuff for you guys momentarily. By the way, um, we. We had to take my mom's phone in because there was a problem with like her old iPhone communicating with the the Apple cloud and there was so much stuff on the cloud and she was just like, I want to get rid of the cloud. I'm going back to an Android. I need somebody to like download all of the stuff on the cloud and put it on just an external hard drive, like going back in time, basically, you know? Right. And so there was this uh, cell phone repair guy in the building that I used to be in, um, from my office was in and we brought the phone and, and we gave him the login info and we were having him work on this. <laughs> and he was like, wait, this can't be right. No, the, this, this isn't, this isn't right. Right. It, it says that you have, I forget what the number was, but it was like, you, it says you have like 200,000 photos in the oh my God. cloud. And we laughed and we were like, Oh, sweet darling. Yes, that's correct. And those are all from her iPhone. She also oh has cam- like a DSLR camera. She has filled numerous like terabyte sized external hard drives with photos of either like birds or my child. So we right. have, we've joked before that Jess is the most photographed child on the face of the earth because grandma was like obsessively snapping photos with her either with her camera camera or the cell phone for a lot of years but the guy was so dumbfounded that there were so many photos on her apple cloud or whatever it was or i iCloud. Right. Um, but that was only from her cell phone and that was only like two years worth of photos <laughs> oh my gosh it was yeah perfect. yeah that's like me with chip though soon to be yeah. cecilia but chip is oh, uh chip is a lot on my phone <laughs> sometimes yep. to an embarrassing should. degree but yes never We'll just well, have to wait and see what this nug, nugget baby looks like, and we'll yep. we'll snap some pictures and post them. And I'm excited to see her. It'll be grand. She'll yes. be adorable. She'll be adorable. She'll be, she'll be hairy. I'm like, mark my word, she's going to be a hairy baby. Because <laughs> I, was, I was hairy. Armand, like being Persian, was really hairy when he came out. So I'm just like, this baby's going to have some hair. I'm like already picturing that. It'll be interesting to see, like, the color, 
She's but, gonna be um, bald just to spite you. She's she's listening to you right now, and she's like, "Screw you, mom! I'm gonna be bald." She's make, sucking maybe hair follicles right. back into her head right now. Maybe you're right, but I just think this baby's gonna come out like a hairball on her head. Um, have tons of hair, so we'll see. Time I kind of like that, so um, I'm hoping she has a lot of hair. Time will tell. Well, uh, Very true. tell me, my darling. The people already know the topic for the day. and They're probably waiting for us to, to get right. to it already. What right. are we talking mm-hmm. about? So we're going to talk a little bit about weight loss today. And, you know, it's a super common and almost accepted part of an IBS or SIBO journey a lot of times when people are going on restrictive diets I often find that their doctors sort of nonchalantly shrug off weight loss, and sometimes it's considerable. Um, And again, to me, it shouldn't really ever be ignored. Maybe if it's like a pound or two or something where there's like some slight variation where we're all going to have some slight variation even day to day in our weight. So again, I'm, I'm probably talking about especially weight changes. Um, and it really depends on how big you are as well starting out because like a five pound shift in someone that's a hundred pounds is going to be a big deal yeah. compared to someone that's like a 200 pound guy who loses five pounds is less of a percentage of their, um, their usual body weight. So I- again, I-, I think there's nuanced dis- discussion here in terms of like how much weight to consider. Um, I do know there's guidelines. I'll have to pull them up too at some point um, that RDs use for like yeah. this amount of weight loss at, out of three months. Mm. Like this percentage of weight loss at three months should be flagged. This percentage of weight loss at six months should be flagged. This percentage at weight loss at one year should be flagged. Yeah. Um, That's which again, go ahead. Good, good for people to know. Just to right. get get a ballpark. And I do want to say, too, um, and you kind of alluded to this ever so slightly, um, to be honest, probably a lot of the people who are listening to this episode right now are doing so because they thought that we would talk about, like, if, right. you, heal, if you heal your SIBO, you will lose weight. Right. And maybe that's a whole separate episode, right? Like, if you guys want us to do an episode like that, Maybe put the comments down below on this YouTube video if you're watching on YouTube, and we would consider doing that. But really what we're talking about is when is weight loss a red flag? Like when is it no longer okay and you shouldn't be ignoring it anymore versus a person who was overweight or obese to begin with and wanting to lose weight was like one of their health goals And in healing their gut and cleaning up their diet, they happen to lose weight as a part of that process of getting healthier. Like that's a little bit of a different thing. And there does seem to be linkage with like metabolic health and things like diabetes and insulin resistance with the gut microbiome and with um, the leaky gut or a non-leaky gut. So there is a conversation to be had around that. But I think for right now, I want to just focus on in somebody who doesn't necessarily need to lose a lot of weight or that's not a primary goal and there's not being an effort to lose a bunch of weight, but they go on a restricted diet and then they start right. dropping a whole ton of weight. Like where do you start raising an eyebrow and thinking, Hey, this is no longer cool. This is no longer acceptable. And to your point, a lot of times it gets shrugged off. Even heck, like I, I remember I sent you a message because I was so pissed about this I I was working with a guy who had worked with another functional practice in the Raleigh area, well-known, like well-regarded, and they were treating his SIBO. And amongst many antimicrobials and supplements, they had him doing a a paleo, low FODMAP, low sulfur diet. Oh my God. Right? Like I'm just, I'm cringing just thinking about it. Paleo, low FODMAP, low sulfur, And he had lost like 40 pounds and he was not especially overweight. Like I think he might've even used the word, like he was a little bit fluffy to begin with. Like he maybe had like 20 pounds of adipose that he could shave off, but he was like a pretty tall, reasonably fit guy. And he dropped like 40 pounds. And the thing that I'm really horrified by, like 
this clinic, they do functional medicine, but but this stuff flies under the radar at functional places all the time. And in particular, this place is run by a medical doctor and some like PAs and nurse practitioners. And oftentimes the allopathic conventional people tend to care even less about nutrition and weight loss right. um, compared right. to like a naturopath or a chiropractor where maybe, maybe they would give a crap about this. There's at least a little smidgen of a glimmer of hope for that, that holistic world. But right. you know, it's like, Oh, it's the clinic is an MD and like some, some physician assistants and whatever. They have a staff nutritionist and the staff nutritionist told the guy when he brought up, hey, I've lost like 40 pounds. The freaking staff nutritionist said, yeah, that's fine. Oh my God. What the F? (laughs) That's the thing that really just boggles my mind and makes me want to grind my teeth into dust. Right. A dietitian or a nutritionist should know better. Right. I would say typically, again, I'd be curious if it was an RD. I feel like RDs like in school are very much like that's a huge part of hospital dietetics is weight loss prevention because it's linked to way worse outcomes in people in the hospital. Like if someone's not able to maintain their weight or they have an unintentional weight loss, that's a big thing that's flagged in acute situations in the hospital. So like if someone has a a heart attack or, you know, they're right, they're struggling with issues. We have a system like a medical record system that'll flag people that have lost weight. And that's someone that a dietitian has to prioritize. So it's interesting because in the more conventional dietetic space, this is something that's very heavily emphasized. Um, I think in the more of like the, the convenient, conventional medical space beyond like maybe the acute setting for RDs because our culture is pretty weight loss centric in terms of you know oh weight loss is good uh, weight gain is bad I do think that that creates a perception that oh this isn't that big of a deal or like weight loss is fine but to me again it shows that you're not nourishing properly uh, typically, again, like if this is untrue, unintentional weight loss, um, you're like, oh, I don't know why I'm losing weight. And it's coming off at a rate that's too high. To me, again, like you're not getting what your body needs. And again, like we talked about with Kaylee not that long ago, it's like in order for your gut to function optimally, it, it needs fuel. And yeah. in order for to repair gut issues, it needs fuel. So if you're constantly under fueled, your body's constantly going to be in a f- more of a fight or flight state. It's not going to be in a state that's ready to to heal and things like that and to move forward on, on a gut journey. So yeah, I, I just, I find it very frustrating because similar to you, even in my own journey, like I'm trying to think exactly how much I weighed when I was going through my gut stuff, but I'm pretty confident it was around 25-ish pounds that I lost in like a four-month span, which is a lot of weight. Um, It's not okay. I wasn't heavy at all prior. I was a runner. Um, You said you're like 5'6", right? Yeah, I'm like 5'6". I'm trying to think of what it was. I was probably around 135 maybe, and then I dropped to like 110 ish like or somewhere around there maybe it was like 112 ish but like i'm generally more of a stocky build like i have kind of thick legs um stronger looking arms like again i'm not like necessarily a super skinny person but i was thin and like really fit at the 135 stage um and again i dropped it right i dropped a ton of weight like and again, it's always obvious to people who know you because yeah. I didn't look right. Like they were like, oh, she looks not like herself, like at Appreciated. all. Appreciated. Yeah. Right. So um, a- again, no doctor flagged me. And I'm like, that's a huge weight loss. Um, and again, this was before I was in dietetic school, so I couldn't flag myself. But I yeah. think because I was still on the verge of a regular BMI, I was getting close to the to the problem zone for BMI. Yeah. But because I was still in the normal BMI, I think 
it wasn't necessarily fl- flagged by the conventional space. Um, even again, like the GI docs didn't really flag it, which I think's interesting too, because it's like, I don't know, you would want to at least rule out, I wasn't having malabsorption issues. I think mainly my issue was under cons- consumption just because I was on yeah. restrictive diets and things like that. Yeah. And I was having a lot of symptoms that was kind of preventing intake. So it was a whole mess. But, you know, at least if I was a GI doc, maybe rule out malabsorption. They did some tests, again, like some screening tests and things like that. But again, it's it's just crazy to me that it wasn't red flagged as, whoa, she's lost 25 pounds. That's not okay. Um, yeah. Especially if how quickly it happened. Um, but again, I, I even think like what you're saying, a lot of the functional docs kind of turn a blind eye to it too. My functional doc didn't really yeah. think that much of it. Well, I, um, think, I think what you said is right. I think that in, in the world today, particularly in quote unquote developed countries like America, Canada, Australia, UK, Europe, um, we see weight loss, good weight gain, bad. Right. Always. That's always the conversation. And, you know, even simple things like if somebody asks you, oh, hey, did you lose weight? It's almost always with a tone of, oh, hey, girl, did you lose weight? You look good. You look sexy. And and if somebody asks you, oh, hey, did you did you gain weight? It's always with this like, "Um, hey, like, did you gain weight? Like, do you need to talk or something? And, you know, we picture that people are just stuffing their faces with Oreos all day long. But, it, yeah, there's definitely this, like, stigma with it. I think also, and I've said this before, and I'll probably get some shit for it, but whatever. The functional medicine field loves to say all day, every day, that food is medicine and we help heal the body with food. They don't. They and naturopaths alike, almost always, 99.99% of the time, functional medicine doctors and naturopaths, help people using nutrition by teaching people what bad food to eliminate or what elimination diet to use. They never, ever, ever have a conversation about tracking calories, tracking protein. Are you losing and gaining weight at the appropriate pace? Are you nourishing yourself? Do you feel like you have enough energy throughout the day? Like, are you emaciated? There's never a conversation with this. Or, hey, you had to cut out these three foods. Why don't we find some replacements for you? Because if you think too, if nothing else, wheat and corn are two really huge parts of the American diet. You take right. those things away and people literally don't know what to eat. And right. then you take out like onion and garlic and some other like flavoring agents and avocados and they yeah. half the time they don't know what to eat. So it's really not surprising that people lose weight unintentionally on these diets if they're not careful about it. But yeah, it's like even the functional people... It are I think a we all live in this world we all are a little bit brainwashed to think weight loss good weight gain bad, but right. also again like they're in my space they're always just concerned with what bad food can we cut out next never how do we how do we reintroduce foods or how do we help people be more nourished and and you know and I will say too um but, well there's there's probably a couple other things that we could talk about and I don't want to go off too hard on a tangent right now but it's um maybe there's also like a touch of ego involved also of like well my program is so good that only good things can happen to you like i don't know if you've seen this come from other practitioners Mm. before but like i've had people where they've said i felt horrible 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 on x y and z supplement and i told my my doctor or my naturopath or my whoever and they literally said well you must be weird like (laughs) the supplement works the supplement is great you must be weird and it's like wow can you imagine being so confident and so egotistical in your life that you you look somebody dead in the eye and say yeah you felt like garbage on that supplement you're the problem not my supplement my protocol is great you're the problem wow Like, so I wonder if that's a piece of it too, is like, I think on some level, a lot of practitioners don't even want to think that they're harming their patient in some way with their advice. And it's like a little bit of a, of an ego thing. Well, and, 
and I do think too, like, unfortunately, a lot of practitioners in the health and wellness space have a little disordered eating anyway. Yes. Like, so then they're guiding people with diets that might not be appropriate for them. Again, certainly aren't focusing on nourishing. And I think the key thing to remember, again, reharping on this, like, to me, nourishing is the number one priority. You can't jump ahead to trying to starve the SIBO or trying to do, like, again, like, trying to reduce inflammatory foods. Like, to me, that's a secondary thing. Like, yeah. if you can't find a way to make sure that you're, one, getting enough fuel, that is just the baseline of all nutrition that just gets totally skipped in the functional space. And it, it's so frustrating to maneuver through. But yeah, it's just, it's crazy to me that doctors don't pay attention to how people are actually implementing their their uh, routines. And, and it would probably be really hard because doing the restrictive diets are hard. So making sure someone's nourished on a diet that ha is AIP um, is going to be rather challenging. So I yeah. think a lot of them just kind of skip over it. Like they could spend all their work having someone optimize an AIP diet. Yeah. Like that could be all the work that they're doing together in, in five sessions or something. But instead they have other things they want to focus on. But it's like, if you're going to go that restrictive, you almost need to really harp on the composition uh, yeah. of the diet. And I, and I think too, just having an off ramp, which again, a lot of them don't either. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think in terms of like, I think people might be wondering, well, what is the amount of weight loss to really pay attention to? And again, like some people might be undernourished and not losing weight too. So yeah. this isn't always the best indicator of if you're nourished either. I did want to point that out. So I know people, people that are... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I know some people that are completely undernourished by a lot and they've gained weight. Um, I've definitely seen that too. I, I, I mean, there could be me too. there's metabolic things that could be going on there. Um, so it's it's I think for a lot of people it can be a, a, an interesting marker, but it doesn't always rule out because I'll talk to people and they'll say, "Well, I'm maintaining my weight, but I'm like, well, we're looking at your nutrition and it's not it's suboptimal." Yeah. Um, so again, well, it doesn't always rule out being completely nourished, but yeah. Um, it can be a really good indicator if if you do notice that you're having some weight loss. Yeah, I, th I think it's like if you're dropping a bunch of weight, you can be pretty darn certain that you're under fueling. Right. But the lack of that symptom doesn't guarantee that you're off scot-free without that problem. And it could be that your body is compensating in a different way. Right? right? Like you, you mentioned there are people who under fuel and then they gain weight. I've seen that too. Um, and that was actually something the the friend with the pots and the stuff that I've mentioned on and off for the last few months, um, she had, had lived that a lot, like over the mm -hmm. years. And she tried these various different restricted diets and she would almost always like, she would maybe lose a pound and then gain another pound or two back. And if anything, even when she knew for sure that she was severely cutting calories or severely cutting carbs, her weight would either not budge or she would, it would remain high. And I would say too, like a lot of people with suboptimal thyroid function, right. your, your body is probably seeing, Hey, we don't have enough gasoline. Let's make sure the car can only go to 20 miles an hour. So you mm -hmm. throttle down your metabolism and you start throttling down things like your sex hormones and your brain output, like how much your brain is able to do on a day-to-day -day basis and your thyroid. And I think there are a lot of people who lose weight going on these restrictive diets, but there are also people who just have suboptimal thyroid function or right. they just have fatigue and brain fog and they're like lethargic and they don't know why their brain doesn't seem to work. But then I think I mentioned on the last episode or maybe two ago, my guy, no, it was last time, my guy with pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, he thought that he had brain fog and fatigue and that he was lethargic and, and feeling crappy because he was malabsorbing 
but it turned out it was just because he was under eating in addition to all the other stuff that was going on. Mm -hmm. And like within a week or two of having him just eat more food, he said his energy was starting to come back and he was actually able to like get more done and function better. And then a couple weeks after that, he started working out again for the first time in years. He was just under eating. Like it was that simple. It didn't have to be some fancy medical diagnosis. It was literally just, why don't you eat more? Done. Right, right. And again, I I think your metabolism is going to compensate with whatever fuel you're you're giving it. So it's going to slow down how you're burning it. And that's going to affect a lot of different areas. Your body's going to be especially reactive to whatever you're feeding it. And so I do think you're right. I mean, I've definitely had tons of clients where just simply getting them what they need makes a huge difference in overall function, gut function. Maybe it doesn't make it 100% perfect in all cases, but I've I've seen, again, like some people, that be it for them. Like yeah. just getting their nutrition where it needs to be is the main thing that they need to focus on. Yeah. But um, in terms of like, if you are having weight loss, when is, when is it a high concern? I think anytime you're having a little yeah. bit of weight loss, it probably makes sense to check in with calories and chronometer. Um, but, you know, in terms of like... And sorry, general- I'm going to interrupt you for a second. <laughs> That'd be rude. Yeah. Again, I want to reiterate, you all have no excuse. Chronometer is free. <laughs> right. It's free, people. And I know damn well that if you're listening to this podcast right now, you are either on a smartphone or on a computer. And you can use chronometer for free on a smartphone or a computer. So none of you have any excuse to not check your calories and your macros real quick. And it literally has a scanny barcode thing. You can scan a granola bar or a pop tart, and it will magically put all that information into the app and magically calculate stuff. Right. So hear us now. You have no excuse. Go track your shit for a day or two and see what happens. You might be surprised. Right, right. Continue. So, I'm sorry. Again, the, these are criteria. These are like specific criteria for malnutrition. So, um, this is the weight loss criteria for the diagnosis of malnutrition for chronic illnesses. So, this is kind of more specific to like MNT, um, medical nutrition therapy by the American Dietetics Association. So this would say that any weight loss equal or greater to 5% loss of body weight in the first month would be kind of flagged for potential malnutrition. Equal or greater than 7.5% loss of body weight in three months. Equal to or greater than 10% loss of of weight in six months. And equal or greater to 20% loss um, in one year. So, like, for me, as an example, I, I, this is from an article I read a little while ago um, that I'm referring to, um, but I lost 11% of my body weight in the first month, so I would have hit that criteria in about 18% of my body weight total um, in, again, probably a three to four month span. So, again, I would have been flagged. I'm sure your guy that lost 40 pounds would have been Absolutely. flagged. Yeah. Um, And again, there's a lot of people that I see not being really flagged or paid attention to, even though they would meet some guidelines for malnutrition. You usually want to pair a couple other things as well um, when you're looking at weight loss. Um, I I don't know if that's the only criteria that they use. A lot of times they'll like look at um, like changes in the body. There's a couple other criteria that they'll try to do like two of the six, I think. So it's one aspect of it, but it's still something, again, that's flagged as malnutrition in the conventional sphere. Yeah. And notice that she's using the term malnutrition, not automatically going to malabsorption. Because I think that's the thing, too, is that a lot of people with SIBO and IBS and gut problems, like, I've I've skimmed SIBO Facebook groups forever and (laughs) ever. I've read a lot of the comments on my YouTube channel, the comments on this podcast. I don't always get a chance to respond to them, but I do generally read a lot of them. And I've followed enough stuff on the internet for years now, and I've literally never seen the world, the word malnutrition used in the SIBO space right. once. But I've seen malabsorption mentioned all the damn time. Everybody right. and their brother thinks that they have malabsorption. 
nobody's giving a shit about malnutrition. And it's, you know, it's like 90, 10, like 90% of people think that they have malabsorption. And it's really probably a much smaller percent, like maybe 10% of people actually do. Right. Probably like 90% of people have some degree of malnutrition that they could be addressing. And again, like using a free app with chronometer, like it doesn't get easier than that. But, um, and the thing that boggles my mind too, I'll, I'll share this perspective also, you know how there's, there's a lot of this talk about, um, in conventional medicine, especially there's basically like no nutrition training whatsoever for doctors. Right. Uh, there was a study out of UNC Chapel Hill actually a while back where they surveyed a lot of medical schools in the United States. And I think the average was a, uh, I think the average for all, all the medical schools that they surveyed was like one hour of nutrition coursework right. in all of medical school. Right. One hour, like one lecture of one class, one day, that's it. Right. And, um, you know, maybe like a really good medical school would have a single two hour lecture. Right. A right. lot of medical schools have zero and like kind of the average is one. Um, luckily, like with chiropractic school, we had a lot of biochemistry and nutrition. And I, I probably had like four or five classes on various types of nutrition over the course of school. And then biochemistry was two semesters as well. Um, but I remember like even outside of the nutrition and biochem classes, this came up in, uh, like the physical exam kind of coursework, even to keep an eye out for weight loss. You know why? If nothing else, if nothing else even crosses your brain as a doctor, y'all better be watching out for cancer Mm -hmm. because unexpected weight loss, particularly in the elderly is a huge, huge red flag for cancer. So if you're, in my opinion, if you're a doctor of any variety, I don't care if you're a naturopath, a chiropractor, a medical doctor, I don't care who you are. If you're a doctor or a medical provider of a a high enough degree and you see somebody who's dropping this kind of weight and you're not talking to them about it, at least briefly, holy crap, man, you could get sued for malpractice because heaven forbid you have that one patient where you just think, oh, gosh, golly gee, all my supplements and stuff are really working and making this person healthier. Yay for me. And that they've got a big old tumor. Right. That is malpractice waiting to happen. Because that's right. like a widely known red flag. And it just kind of boggles my mind. Like, even if doctors don't care about the malnutrition thing, fueling the body, having enough protein or enough enough substrate to fuel the body and heal the body, like, even if they don't give a rat's ass about this, how is this not being brought up, at least in the context of, hey, we need to make sure you're doing okay, because the, if if you are taking in enough food and you're losing this kind of weight, we need to start screening out big, hairy, scary things like cancer. Like, right. I don't know. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's madness. And I, I do think, again... It's not always super easy. Again, I I will admit that at times. Like, again, if you're someone that, especially if you're coming from a very low calorie point to get calories up, so, and to try to get weight on, like, sometimes that can be a little bit of a difficult process. Not always, but especially if you're symptomatic. Again, sometimes I'm talking to people and they're, like, incredibly symptomatic. And I'm like, well, you're eating 1,200 calories, but you need 2,000 calories a day. So... That's a big jump and it can be a little bit of a hurdle, especially at first. Um, So I do think sometimes it's a little bit harder if, if maybe the, it started out, like maybe intake, intake has drifted. Maybe you're on some restrictive diets, but I also think there's a subset of people that just like don't eat or skip meals because of the symptoms. And it's like that kind of confounds or compounds the the issues too, because if you're not eating regularly and you're constantly in a deficit, it's going to hinder digestive capacity and motility even more. So I do empathize with some of my clients that come to me and it's like, oh, they want to kind of add calories in. But it's a bit of like a slow roll of getting getting them up to speed. And there's different things that we do to help with the process. But also, if you're like doing chronometer tracking on your own 
and you're like, I'm like super low <laughs> now that I've looked, um, certainly there's different things you could potentially do to add extra calories in without tons of volume. But um, doing maybe some digestive supportive things in general could be helpful too. Um, just to ease symptoms through the transition. You also could just have a transition that you have to move through where it might be a little bit uncomfortable anyway. I was going to ask you that because I just had a conversation with a patient not that long ago. Um, So when she did chronometer tracking for me, um, I think she just did two days. But like one of the days, I looked at the first day and I was like, I'll be darned. Okay, she took in like 2,000 or 2,100 right. calories, and it was like spot on. I was like, okay, I'll be damned. That looks way better than I thought it would. Right. And then I looked at the second day, and it was like 14 or 1,500 calories, I think. Mm-hmm. I was like, ah, there we go. And we ended up talking quite a lot about, all right, your goal for the next few weeks is to try to shoot somewhere in between the two days that you showed me. Because she was saying, like, she felt like she fell off the wagon with that one day and then she paid the price for it. And I was kind of telling her, I said, you know, to be honest, your body might not trust you very much right now because your intake is really erratic. Like, you could use your willpower and be strict with your diet for like a week or two or whatever it might be. And then you totally go off the rails and like eat, you know, a, a whole ton of nut butter or whatever, like, and, and you way over consume, but then you feel guilty or you have symptoms that flare. And then you're like super strict on the diet again. And like, there's this roller coaster effect and the, your body doesn't know what to expect from you anymore. She also has had amenorrhea for years. Right. And I was like, why don't we just start off by trying to aim somewhere halfway between? So like, I think I gave her the recommendation of like, you know, maybe 1800 calories on a, right. on average, like add a little bit of, I think like, I think for her nut butter was a big one, like add a little bit of nut butter on each of the days, but that way we're going to start getting some stability And I did tell her, I said, the next couple of weeks might be a little bit squirrely feeling because you might have some changes that you're not super fond of for the next couple of weeks, but I'm going to ask you to trust me and kind of push through and get to the point where I really think that in like three, four weeks, you're going to feel quite a lot better, even just making this small little change and taking like the you know, the erratic up and down right. and kind of smoothing it out. But there does need to be some degree of trust in your provider or your own body and just trusting that you're giving your body what it needs. And that might mean that, you know, in the short term, your body's like, whoa, oh my God, like, how do I digest all of this new food? But just trust that you can get to the other side of that and your body will learn how to adapt to that. Um, right. I just had that conversation with somebody recently, so I was going to bring that up and see if you've had similar conversations. Right. Well, and I think you're dead on because it it's going to take consistency at the higher calorie point to give your body the feedback that, oh, we have the fuel to to yeah. digest the food. It's, it's again, it could be a weird cycle that you can get caught in of under eating and then kind of poor digestion and it's dicey to get out of, I think, at times. For me, I usually would say depending on the degree of the calorie deficit. So like if someone especially is like a thousand or twelve hundred calories a day, which isn't like crazy abnormal um, yeah. from what I've seen, uh, it's definitely low. That's probably less than a toddler would eat, which again, like I, I think to conceptualize um, just not getting enough. So um for people like that i definitely think like a little bit of a stepwise approach can be helpful so like okay we're going to talk in two weeks if you can bump up to 1400 that would be great we're going to talk again in in another week or two how about you get up to 16 1700 so i do think sometimes for people that have big deficits doing a calorie kind of bump up a little bit slower can be helpful um and less overwhelming. 
um, of the system, some people can just jump to a higher calorie point. Um, again, with that big of a deficit, I think it's harder for the body yeah. to do that. Um, again, if your deficit's more like three or 400 calories, you might be able to jump to a higher, a higher calorie point a little bit more easily. It just depends. Um, you can experiment with it, but I think the key is progress. So as long as you're progressing in, in a better direction, yeah. um, at a reasonable pace, I think that that's going to be po- a positive move in the right direction. So even if you're feeling like, okay, I'm, I'm in a 400 calorie deficit and jumping up seemed to really be, feel like a lot, um, maybe I'll just do an extra one to 200 for the next couple weeks and then I'll bump up to the rest. Um, but again, I do think potentially doing some digestive supportive stuff can be really helpful through the transition as well to help speed up the process. Um, also, like just eating more of the foods that you know you can tolerate reasonably well. Right. Right. Like right. you don't you don't have to layer in increasing your calories and also introducing or reintroducing a new food. You don't have to do those at the same time. Like you can you can just increase your calories first right and then a little bit down the road then you can focus on adding things that you weren't able to tolerate previously right and i think that's a much better priority list like again if you're not fueling everything's going to be off um so i agree with you definitely focusing on getting enough calories is number one priority compared to adding diversity adding diversity still i think is really important but yeah. it's going to come it's going to come much easier down the road if you're getting enough calories that can fuel digestion and motility and gut function in a much better way. You're going to well, tolerate a lot more foods. And presumably people who have eliminated foods, like say the FODMAPs, for example, presumably the people who have eliminated those foods have done so because they don't feel good when they eat them and right. they feel like they don't tolerate the foods anymore. But they might not be tolerating the foods because they can't heal their gut and they can't run their motility and they can't make thyroid hormone and they can't work their brain and their nervous system appropriately. And if you just give that human being more calories and nourish them for a few months, the root causes of why they couldn't tolerate the foods probably will start to resolve or they'll at least get notably better And then when they go to reintroduce the foods, it's a heck of a lot easier. Yeah, 100% agree. And I I would say, too, um, a couple other things to just think about is, like, the volume of food you're eating. So um, I will say sometimes I'll have discussions around, like, if someone's eating a lot of vegetables or a lot of fruits or something like that, um, I still encourage them to eat those things, but... You might want to manipulate the the volume of those foods that you're eating in comparison with the volumes of really calorie dense foods. Um, that could be fats. That could be more like starchy stuff that just generally has a yeah. little bit more calories. So if you're feeling like you just can't take more in, thinking a little bit about the the extra volume because adding broccoli is not going to help. Adding yeah. you know, especially non starchy vegetables in particular are not really going to add a ton of calories. Um, so they're still good for you um, right but for this conversation you're only going to get you know 10 20 extra calories out of another cup of broccoli versus and it's going to take up a lot of space yeah so that's like the thing is like the feeling of fullness if you're struggling with that thinking a little bit about the volume versus like again if you threw in an extra tablespoon of olive oil or something or added that to your cooking um that's going to add 120 calories with a very small amount of, and again, some people might not tolerate more increases in fats. Maybe they, they're going to do better with an increase in things like starches, which are also probably not as low volume, high calorie as a fat, but they're still yeah. going to be a lot more calories per volume compared to like a non-starchy vegetable. Yeah. So some of these things can be interesting to think about just on how you're planning your plate with increasing calories is like, okay, probably adding a little bit more fat or a little bit more starch is going to push the needle more than manipulating other variables. Yeah. And, and I'll throw out an idea too. Um, 
one of my favorite little things to like add in like so there are days where like I've I'm on top of nutrition and I feel like ah like I've kind of paced out and I've gotten all of my protein and my fiber and my variety and I've like hit all the things right and then there are just other days where I don't know if I'm not feeling it as much or I'm kind of lazy or if I'm a little bit more rushed and I'm like ah like that was kind of a a small breakfast or lunch like what can I kind of add to it to fluff it up a little bit um macadamia nuts are fantastic because they're so fatty but also like salty and crunchy so even just a small handful of macadamia nuts goes a long long way and gets you quite a few calories i know like i've always liked them but i got turned on to that a little bit more when i did the fasting mimicking diet because they would give Mm -hmm. you like like they would give you little packs of olives in oil and they would give you like little you know bars that are predominantly macadamia nuts um, right. like bars and like a little bit of honey and I forget what else. Um, and they were really quite calorie dense for what you got, but it was primarily fat. Um, right. But that's kind right. of something that I, you know, I priced it out. Costco has the best deal and I just keep a bag nice. in my cupboard and it can last a couple of months because I'm only having, you know, a couple here or there, but it's a nice little way to add some, some extra calories when you're feeling like you're a little bit low. Yeah. And again, I think fats in general, So I kind of think of most nuts as being primarily fatty. Um, Things like avocado, um, sometimes even changing like the, maybe you have been eating more lean fish, like tilapia or whitefish. You could lean more heavily on things like sardines or salmon that have more fat in them. You can sometimes do that with meats too. Um, As long as you feel like it's, it's well tolerated. Um, but again, I think that there's different ways to potentially increase um, the fats, but that can sometimes be a nice lever for people. I, I find that a lot of people are a little bit lower in carbs, too. So, like, again, if you notice on your chronometer, if you track that your one macro is a little bit lower than where it needs to be, you can always lean more heavily on that. So, like, if your carbs are kind of low, you're probably better off trying to increase calories with carbs too. So whenever I work with someone, it's like looking at their macros to see like, okay, they're under calories by 500 calories. And it looks like they're getting a decent amount of fat in. Their carbs look a little bit lower. I'm probably going to more emphasize adding in some carbs compared to fats based on what they're currently getting. So that's a good point. Yeah, just kind of checking in to see where your macros are falling can help you individualize that a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, it it can certainly take a little bit of experimenting to figure out how you're going to get there. And um, again, if you're struggling to, I'd, I'd recommend working with someone as well. Um, but yeah, I think that there's different ways to manipulate it to to meet your needs there's not necessarily a one way or right way to build up calories yeah and well and even i'll throw something out there um it's it's not the best option probably but it is an option for people where it's like okay we need more calories coming in but maybe they don't feel like they could tolerate eating more food even the stuff that they tolerate halfway decently Mm. I have had some people get the elemental diet formula Mm. and use that as like a, you know, like a shake of sorts. I don't, I'm not a big fan of using it as like a gut reboot or whatever it is that Riskio is calling it now on all of the damn Instagram ads I see. Like, I don't think it's appropriate to use it to reboot your gut. And I don't know Mm. if it's really that helpful and effective for treating the SIBO. If you wonder why, go check out that episode. But it, It is like a fairly hypoallergenic, kind of pre-digested way to get some calories. It's it's expensive, but it's probably not going to flare up your symptoms if you have IBS or SIBO. And if you're in that tough place where, you know, it's like you under eat a bit and then your metabolism throttles down and your, your, your ATP, your energy availability gets throttled down. And now you're not able to make enzymes and stomach acid and bile and your nervous system's not really working quite as good. 
and then you restrict your diet more and you drop your calories more and then all of those things get worse and it's like you've spiraled down to the point where you're really at a calorie deficit but now your nervous system and your digestive juices and your gut function and your hormone function all are throttled down so low that they're they're not working as efficiently as right. is needed and now it's like that's holding you back from increasing your calorie intake it is sometimes useful to use that elemental diet formula of like elemental heal and just kind of like get some kind of almost pre-digested calories in your body for a period of a month or two and use that as a band-aid so that your hormones and your gut function and your enzymes and your ATP production and your nervous system, like all of those things can kind of start to come back to life to some degree right. and function a bit better. And then eventually you discontinue the elemental heal or maybe you, you swap it out eventually for like, you know, a protein powder or like some other type of meal replacement shake that's a little bit more well-rounded. Um, but that can work too. If, if none of the options presented thus far have been appealing to you or you feel like they're not doable, you could use the elemental diet as a Band-Aid in the meantime. Um, that that is a reasonable use for that, I think. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, I've had a few clients do that. Um, and it's been really beneficial. I would say the main thing, just to um, just to clarify, I definitely would try other things first. So, like, sometimes yes. people are like, oh, I can't add calories. And, like, they might jump on Elemental a little bit early yeah. um, versus actually just trying to get intake up um, and, and see how you do with it. So, I would try some of the other stuff first, but I think elemental could be a good like backup plan if you're just really stuck. Um, yeah. So I like that you brought that up because I do think that that can be a strategy that's um, more doable for some people uh, yeah. if they get really stuck between a rock and a hard place with building calories up. Yeah. And, and you're right. It is more of, I don't want to say last ditch, but it's like second to last ditch resort. Like, I feel like elementals always like our our last ditch <laughs> is a last ditch thing. I feel like I'm almost to the point where I would rather see somebody do FMT rather than elemental. Like I'm kind of <laughs> right, at that right. point as far as like the actual protocol and like starving yourself for two weeks. I would almost rather like send somebody on a poopcation like you did and have them do FMT. Um, <laughs> right, like right. It's, it's ludicrous that this is being used so widely, and the fact that you could buy the elemental diet on an Instagram ad and it's presented as like a gut reset. Ooh, we need to do a, a part two to the roast of Dr. Ruscio on this podcast eventually. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's like, try, try eating real food first. If you try a few different options and you find that you're still, you're still having a hard time getting the calories up, then uh, by all means. But I'll say this too. Um, sometimes there's a conversation to be had where... Um, The people listening to this podcast right now and the people who work with us are doing so because they have symptoms. A lot of times the symptoms are really frustrating or painful or maybe even scary and and people get in like a really deep dark place mentally. And um, like people will sometimes take the initiative to book an appointment with you or I or enroll in one of our group coaching programs or something like that. But then deep down, they're terrified to change anything because there's mm -hmm. that little voice in their head saying, oh my God, what if it makes it worse? Right. Like, I'm already dealing with this level of crappiness. I don't think I can handle if it's 2% crappier on top of what I'm already dealing with. Mm -hmm. And it's like this weird kind of mix mixed signal sometimes on our end, and I'm sure you've seen this too, where like people come to us for help and they ask for our help and they fill out all the paperwork and they do all the testing but that they don't follow the recommendations that, that we recommend. And, right. um, and I think sometimes there's this conversation of like, okay, like I said, there might be a little bit of a time for a week or two or three where your body's adjusting to the new calories and trying to learn how to process it. 
but there's a good likelihood that you will start to feel better and you'll start to be rewarded for that soon. But if you do nothing, you're going to stay where you're at. Like you're going to stay at this familiar level of crappiness. Um, Mm. And like, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm trying to articulate at this point, but it's like, um, sometimes too, it's like, okay, you could eat 1400 calories a day and feel like crap, or you could eat 1600 calories a day and feel like crap. Even if you still feel like crap, even if it doesn't immediately shift things in the right direction, at least you're changing something and there's a likelihood that your symptoms will eventually change. But it's like, it, if you're going to feel like crap anyway, you might as well feel like crap and try to do something about it instead of letting the, you know, the kind of like paralysis kick in and prevent you from making any changes. I don't know if I, I don't know, right. it, maybe that circled around to a no, point at some point, but. Yeah, no, I, I understand what you're saying. I feel like there can be a little bit of like a trauma brain response of oh, totally. when you're increasing calories you're and you're getting a little bit more of like some gut symptoms to like be like, whoa, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with this. Um, you know, because the gut, when you're in the gut health space, I know I've been there, there's a level of hypervigilance that's so common. And again, there's fear and stuff. And I do think that there is a little bit of paralysis if you've been around the block for a while of like, oh my God, changing different variables. This is scary. And my body's changing. And I do almost equate it a little bit with sometimes like, I just remember I played a lot of sports growing up and they were all so different. So like in high school, I ran cross country for like the first for the fall. Then in the winter, I played basketball. Then in the spring, I played softball. And especially the transition from cross country to basketball, you're just using insanely different muscles. Like basketball, you're in a squatted stance, you're moving side to side. Um, And just like the first, you know, three to four weeks of practices feeling like, oh my God, like what is happening to my body? Because you're, it's so much shifting, like waking up feeling like, oh my gosh, I can't move like my legs properly. And again, maybe it was too much at that time, but I was young and bounced back. But I think it's a similar thing. Like there's your body's transitioning and trying to adjust, right? It's trying to adapt to the change. And I think that, you know, almost equating it to like a a change in movement can sometimes lead to some soreness, um, lead to like some growing pains. And again, maybe you need like a little bit of extra recovery time and to be into how to take care of yourself in different ways when you're starting a new movement. But I think it's, it's a similar phenomenon. Like as your body, as you move, and you build muscles, like building a muscle is inflammatory. And then your body adjusts and builds muscle. That's how building a muscle works. I think it's the same thing a little bit with with adding some calories in. It's the body is like, what is happening? Uh, this is different. And yeah. so there's an ad- adaptive period of time. And, you know, some degree of pushing through that I think makes sense. You can go a little bit slower if you're feeling like it's too much. And you could maybe add some digestive supports and you could do some things to mitigate some of those things. But there might still just be a level of discomfort that you have to push through a bit. But trusting that on the other side, you'll feel so much better. That's the hard part, I think, when there's been a level of maybe trauma and distrust that someone's gone through in the gut health space. Maybe they've seen a lot of different providers and feel like they've tried a lot of stuff. But again, if these foundational pieces aren't in place, like if someone's chronically under eating, I don't think you can really make gut progress if I'm being completely honest. So again, how many people do do I work with that have been to five providers and they're, they're in a calorie deficit of 500 calories and they've probably been there for, for five years that could have yeah. been the pe- the biggest piece that's holding them back. Maybe some of the other strategies would have worked in combination with that, but it's just such a fundamental piece. Um, so I think just like even reminding yourself that it's just so crucial and fundamental that this stuff gets resolved from a, a nourished standpoint um, 
and again trusting that you'll reap the benefits of that even if there's a bit of a yeah even if there's a hairy period um in there i think being able to have trust in that's really important yeah well and i think that a lot of people no longer trust their body right and that's something that I, i think all of us could work on that to some degree or another but um I know certainly a lot of the people that we've worked with, they just, they don't trust their body. They don't trust providers. They don't, they don't know what to trust anymore. Right. Um, But I think that your analogy is really spot on and I'll, I will add to it if I may. Ooh. So going back to the strategy that we laid forth, if you're at 1200 calories a day, maybe jumping up immediately to 2000 is going to be too much too soon. Maybe you would benefit from taking a week or two at 1400, then a week or two at 1600, a week or two at 1800, and then try to get up to 2000. Similarly, with your analogy, say, you know, the way that sports typically work probably is that you went from cross country season, you ran the last biggest championship race of the year or whatever, right. and then you were done with that thing. And then you immediately started basketball practice and then the season would build and you would go to the championship or whatever. And then that would end and then you would start the next sport. Theoretically, the version of that that would make more sense and make it less painful for you in the transition is if you could have gone from, okay, five days a week practicing cross country, zero days a week practicing basketball. Then you transition to four days a week on cross country, one day a week doing basketball, then you drop it down to three and two, then two and three, one and four, zero, five, and now you're fully into the basketball season. Like right. if you had done that over the course of five weeks, I could almost guarantee that you would not be nearly as sore and you right. wouldn't be like regretting all your life decisions, changing sports right, right. like that. Right. It was but a shock. It's the shock and it's it's your muscles probably not having a lot of time to recover because again, like you you beat yourself up at practice on Monday and then you go back for practice on Tuesday kind of thing. Right. But similarly, I, I think that it goes back to if you are coming to find out that you're at a really bad calorie deficit, give yourself some time. Give yourself that that um that that time gr- and that like, I, I was gonna say respect like almost like um be kind to yourself yeah give yourself grace there yeah um yes. be kind to yourself and don't expect overnight changes um right. i think that happens with supplements and and other, <laughs> yeah. pardon me other lifestyle kind of stuff too if you pick up meditation or yoga or if you start going to get adjusted or start going to get acupuncture like don't don't be the person who thinks, oh my god, I'm going to get overnight change. Um, but just give your your body time to process what you're doing for it, and have the confidence and have the trust in your body to know that you're doing the right thing and that you will be rewarded for your effort as time goes on. But yeah, you know, look, an an unexpected linking of ideas from earlier. In hey, the look the out! Episode. Look Let's out. Yeah, that was a that was a very rough transition, I would say. Again, just going from an endurance sport where like everything's just oh, yeah. a continuous movement essentially to like yeah. fast twitch, rapid yeah. change of sprinting and then kind of slow jogging and squatting. Like again, there's just so much dynamics with well, a basketball like, game. That like lateral movement too. Right. Is you're using your glutes a lot, so you probably got yourself a nice booty there doing that basketball oh, yeah. with all those lateral movements and such. I had some basketball booty during that time. <laughs> in, in rowing, um, pop quiz before we wrap up for the episode, if you had to guess what muscle group you predominantly use in the sport of rowing, what would you guess? Well, I feel like on the surface I'd think arms, but I would imagine you're uh-huh. using major legs, like you're there kind of you're leveraging your legs in some way but i don't know yeah. exactly which muscle everybody and, and their brother always guesses arms and it right. cracks me up because i would say i'm a rower and people would be like oh you must have amazing upper body strength but i'd be like no I do not. 
And like all, almost all rowers will say that too. Like, nope, we don't. Like, right. Basically, zero of us could do a push up. Um, <laughs> even at college, like college level, like D1, like all of us were like, no, we have no upper body strength. But what you do, fun fact for, for the day, you guys, is with rowing, you, you're supposed to keep your arms out in front of you and keep your elbows straight for as long as humanly possible in the stroke. And you kind of have your hand like this, so the oar is sitting in in your grip this way. And they te- they actually tell you, when they're talking about technique, they tell you to hang on the oar, like you're almost hanging from a pole or something. And then you're pushing off and you're using your quads, because it's basically mm-hmm. like a repetitive squat, over and over right. and over again. Right. But you're seated doing it, right. or you're doing like a leg press over and over again. So you're getting all of the initial force for the stroke, you're getting that from from your quads and you're pushing your legs down. And then once your legs are straight, then you rock your body back. And then the very, 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 very last thing, once the boat already has all the momentum, you finish the stroke by then bringing your arms in and getting the war out of the water. So we actually use arms very little compared to quad, but my quads and my core would be like on fire by the end of every single race, every single practice, my quads would be like, absolutely pissed. oh my gosh and i never I, I was always amused by this a lot of my a lot of my teammates would complain uh, my female teammates would complain because a lot of girls don't relish the thought of having like big beefy quads but rowers <laughs> typically will have big beefy strong quads right right and all of my female teammates would complain that their jeans no longer fit because they right. have ripped quads that's <laughs> I I feel that that was me too. Like again, I, it was never a waist thing. It was always like just having some big meaty legs from essentially again all the lateral squatting yeah, type yeah. movements when you're playing defense in a basketball. Yeah. It it cracked me up though. I never had that problem. Like I've always like I don't have twiggy legs. I always had to be very choosy with shopping for jeans because a lot of like a lot of the hot brands like Abercrombie and like gap like the ones that were more in fashion when i was younger um they never fit me like Mm. bro in season or out of season they never fit me regardless i couldn't get them up my thunder thighs or (laughs) over my butt and i remember like i the the weird things that come up like we would try on each other's clothes like all the time right and and like one of my my best friends is about the same height as me we both wore the same size of jeans and I still remember, like, go. I would literally, like, I went through and I tried on all her jeans because she was giving me crap that my Lee brand jeans were not fashionable enough oh, that I got no. at Kohl's or whatever. Oh, yes, no. Paige, I'm talking about you. But she was giving me shit about it. So I was like, all right, let me try on your Abercrombie and your Gap and your old baby jeans. Zero of them fit me, even though oh, we wear the exact same size, because I, like, the crotch of the jeans were, like, four inches too low because I could not get them up my thighs. Oh my gosh. And I don't have big thighs, but like I've got meat on my bones. Right. I got so some anyway. meaty I got some meaty legs. Uh, well, they, there's... When we're united in person, finally, after all these years of podcasting, we're gonna have so many bizarre conversations. Right. So like our We'll meaty send thighs pics of our meaty of thighs out there for Absolutely. the universe to enjoy. We'll, we'll put it in Amy's Instagram story. Right, right, right. Since she uses such things. And look, Hashtag meaty circle. thighs. Hashtag meaty thighs. Um, but yeah, so that's like weird little tangent though that may have been. But guys, I really hope that this episode was helpful. Again, admittedly, we might have lured you into uh, listening to the episode because you thought that we were going to give you tips on how to lose weight in your SIBO journey. If you want us to do an episode about juggling gut healing and how that relates to weight gain, like I said, comment on the YouTube version of this podcast down below and just let us know that that's something you'd be interested in and we could definitely add that to the lineup we have a lot of topics that we want to cover for you guys um but most pressingly a certain someone's going to need to take some time off for maternity leave soon so Mm -hmm. we will be going on a brief hiatus to let amy recover from the craziness that is childbirth but uh we've got some more episodes before we get to that point unless cc gets some funny idea about coming early which she better not Uh, But as always, thank you for tuning in for the IBS Freedom Podcast. And you know the drill, but I'll tell you, like and subscribe and comment down below to all the things if you're on YouTube, if you're on Apple Podcasts, I would deeply appreciate and I'm sure Amy would deeply appreciate a five star review. 
We think we've earned it, but you tell us how you feel about the podcast. And we're on the gram. I'm on YouTube. We're all over the place. Come find us on the internet, and we will see you next week in the next amazing episode. Until then, toodaloo.